In November 2025, Amentum announced it had been awarded an Air Combat Command contract with a ceiling value of up to $995 million. Not for a new stealth aircraft or a next-generation drone, but for maintenance support that keeps the MQ-9 Reaper fleet deployable and ready. That's the part most people miss. Headlines obsess over hypersonics and 6th gen fighters, but the Pentagon is still committing serious money to sustain a platform that, when flown into the wrong threat environment, can be shot down. Since the fall of 2023, Yemen's Houthi rebels have claimed roughly around 15 MQ-9 shootdowns. Public U.S. statements and mainstream reporting have acknowledged multiple MQ-9 losses, including reporting that about seven were lost over a short period in spring 2025 as U.S. operations intensified. And the Reaper has faced pressure outside the Middle East, too, most notably the March 2023 Black Sea incident, where a Russian Su-27 collided with a U.S. MQ-9 after an intercept. So why keep investing? Because the real story isn't Reaper is invincible. It's that the MQ-9 is being pushed through a modernization and sustainment ecosystem that tries to preserve what the platform does best, persistent ISR and networking, while reducing the operational penalties of its weaknesses. You're seeing a shift toward a multi-domain operations configuration, more resilient communications, selective survivability packages, austere basing concepts, and importantly, the maintenance infrastructure needed to keep upgraded aircraft flying instead of waiting for parts and specialists. Over the next few minutes, we're breaking this into five upgrade buckets that actually matter in combat, where they show up first and the risks Pentagon planners usually keep between the lines. The timing of the Amentum Award matters because it lands while the Air Force is living with three pressures that should, on paper, make MQ-9 look obsolete. Pressure one, combat losses are real. In Yemen, the Houthis have repeatedly targeted MQ-9s with a mix of air defense capabilities that open source analysts generally describe as Iranian supplied or derived systems and locally adapted solutions, rather than one single definitively identified missile type. Meanwhile, the publicly reported loss rate in spring 2025 was severe enough that mainstream reporting described roughly seven MQ-9s lost in a short period even as U.S. strikes expanded under Operation Rough Rider. This is the uncomfortable arithmetic of modern air defense. Hardware that can cost tens of millions of dollars per aircraft can be brought down by air defense systems that are far cheaper than the target. Pressure two, the Air Force doesn't pretend it's highly survivable. The Air Force has been explicit for years that MQ-9 is not designed to penetrate modern integrated air defenses. Air and Space Forces reporting describes 2035 as the projected end of MQ-9 service life planning, with the Air Force aiming to keep roughly approximately 140 aircraft through that window while divesting the highest time airframes through 2027 and expecting final MQ-9 deliveries in 2025. Pressure 3. Everyone expects something next, but it isn't here yet. Concepts for a more survivable successor, often described generically in public discourse as MQX, or a next-gen medium-altitude long-endurance ISR strike family, have existed for years, but fielding a true replacement at scale is not quick. And yet, here's the paradox. While the Air Force plans around a long-term sunset, it is simultaneously pushing one of the most comprehensive upgrade cycles the platform has seen. Multi-domain operations configuration, extended endurance options, more resilient C2, selective defensive pods, and even experimentation around mothership concepts. That does not look like a clean retirement. That looks like hedging. So what is the Air Force hedging against? It starts with how the Reaper's original mission model stopped being enough. For two decades, MQ-9 dominated permissive airspace. Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, Syria, counterterrorism campaigns where air defenses were limited, fragmented, or absent. The Reaper's value was simple. Stay up for a very long time, watch continuously, and strike with precision when authorized. But the operating environment changed. Great power competition didn't arrive in a single day. It accumulated. Russia's war in Ukraine showcased layered air defenses and heavy electronic warfare. Iran armed proxies with more capable missiles and sensors. And in Yemen, the Houthis demonstrated that even a non-state actor, properly supplied, can make MQ-9 operations costly. And the platform's weaknesses matter more as threats rise. It isn't stealthy. It's relatively slow compared to fighters. Open source reporting commonly cites cruise speeds in the approximately 230 miles per hour class, depending on configuration. It wasn't originally built around robust onboard self-protection. Still, high-end war doesn't eliminate low-end requirements. Commanders still need persistent ISR, communications relay, and wide area maritime awareness. And in the Indo-Pacific, the scale is brutal. Long distances, 
base vulnerability, and limited high-end assets that can't be everywhere at once. The Air Force and Joint Force need platforms that are affordable enough to deploy broadly, while accepting that not every sortie is in the highest threat airspace. You can't clean sheet a full replacement and field it quickly, but you can evolve an existing fleet and its support ecosystem. That's what this modernization and sustainment story really is. Let's break the MQ-9 transformation into five practical buckets and where the Amentum Maintenance Support contract fits. Bucket 1, Mission Systems Architecture. The core shift is the multi-domain operations, M2DO configuration. In simple terms, it's an effort to make MQ-9 less like a single-purpose counterterrorism hunter and more like a modular network node able to host different payloads and integrate into joint kill chains. Air and Space Forces reporting describes M2DO as including a new architecture and mentions added electrical power and capacity for future sensors and payloads. The direction across the enterprise is also clear. More modularity, more software-defined capability, more rapid reconfiguration. But here's the operational catch. The more complex the configuration, the more you need specialized technicians, test gear, spares, and train maintainers. That is where the sustainment contract matters. Amentum's award is explicitly framed around ACC's RPA maintenance support needs, keeping readiness and modernization initiatives supportable across deployed locations. Bucket two, communications and control resilience. In a great power fight, the link is life. Air and Space Forces reporting describes MQ-9 modernization, including Link 16 integration, along with other upgrades aimed at operating in more contested, and networked environments. Link 16 matters because it's the lingua franca of modern tactical networking. Fighters, ships, and air defense units sharing tracks and messages quickly. Resilient C2 also means redundancy. Multiple paths, hardened waveforms, and a design assumption that GPS interference and jamming will occur. And it's not just about not losing the drone. It's about mission continuity, keeping ISR flowing to the force even when the electromagnetic environment is hostile. Bucket three, survivability enhancements. This is where MQ-9 stops being completely naked, at least for some mission sets. A key example is the Airborne Battle Space Awareness and Defense, ABAD pod, which General Atomics has described as incorporating a BAE system software-defined radio-based electronic warfare capability. And Leonardo DRS, ANAAQ-45, Directional Infrared Countermeasures, DIRCOM, for IR missile defeat. That does not make MQ-9 a stealth aircraft, but it can raise the cost and complexity of successful engagements, especially against simpler IR threats, depending on tactics, geometry, and the threat system. On the cyber and systems integrity side, the broader DoD trend is also clear. Increased attention to onboard monitoring and anomaly detection. Shift 5, for example, has publicly discussed work focused on observability and monitoring for aircraft systems, relevant to resilience against cyber compromise and system anomalies. These don't create invulnerability, they reduce brittleness. Bucket four, sensors, weapons, and drones on drones. Sensors. MQ-9 sensor suite has always been central, and the official USAF fact sheet captures the baseline. ISR-focused design with EOIR and weapons integration as part of the broader system. Rather than asserting a specific new turret model without consistent sourcing, the accurate story is this. MQ-9's value proposition grows as its sensor fidelity, processing, and networking improve, especially for maritime domain awareness, where persistence is decisive. Weapons. MQ-9's common weapons include AGM-114 Hellfire and precision-guided bombs such as GBU-12 and GBU-38 JDAM. And there is a verified milestone that matters for self-escort concepts. The Air Force reported that an MQ-9 successfully employed a Live Aim 9X Block 2 air-to-air missile shot during ABMS on Ramp 2 in September 2020. No one serious is claiming MQ-9 will dogfight fighters, but an air-to-air -air option can complicate certain threat profiles, especially against slower targets, when paired with off-board queuing. Mothership and Altius, this part needed tightening. What is supportable in open sources is that the U.S. Air Force has moved toward buying and integrating Altius family systems under contracts relevant to AVSOC and drone mothership concepts, including a $50 million SBIR Phase 3 award dated October 21, 2025. 
Separately, General Atomics has publicly demonstrated and discussed MQ-9 roles involving control slash launch concepts for attributable effects in support of distributed operations. The accurate framing is, this is an emerging capability area being contracted and demonstrated, not yet a routine, fleet-wide, standard Reaper mission. Getting into and out of the fight, SATCOM launch, recovery, and austere operations. Modernization of MQ-9 also includes operational concepts to reduce dependence on a single, perfect base. Public reporting and official releases describe Satellite Launch and Recovery, SLR, as a capability area and a sustainment demand, and exercises like Reaper Castillo, which focused on operating MQ-9 in contested and agile conditions aligned with agile combat employment concepts. Bucket 5, Sustainment and Distributed Logistics. This is the bucket that decides whether the first four are real or just slides. A Mentum's award is fundamentally about maintenance support, labor, equipment, and the sustainment ecosystem that keeps MQ-9s operational across global locations, including modernization-related support functions. In the Pacific, logistics is not a supporting effort. It is the fight. A distributed MQ-9 posture only works if you can't generate sorties from multiple locations, repair aircraft quickly, and support launch, stock, recovery, and ground equipment without building a giant, predictable footprint. Sustainment is how the Reaper stays relevant, even as the threat environment evolves. This is not theoretical. Basing and deployment show where demand is spiking. Indo-PACOM is getting priority attention. The U.S. Marine Corps has deployed MQ-9A capability tied to VMU-1 to the Philippines, operating from Basa Air Base, with reporting indicating the drones are unarmed and focused on ISR in support of Philippine maritime awareness needs. On the Korean Peninsula, the Air Force activated the 431st Expeditionary Reconnaissance Squadron at Kunsan Air Base in late September 2025 establishing an enduring MQ-9 unit presence there. These moves align with the strategic logic, persistent ISR, and networking over large maritime and littoral spaces without consuming scarce manned assets for every orbit. CENTCOM's harsh math. CENTCOM operations against the Houthis underscore the ugly truth. MQ-9 can be an acceptable loss platform in scenarios where manned aircraft risk escalation pilots, and political blowback. But the loss rate also highlights the limit. Against serious air defenses, MQ-9 must be used with disciplined threat area tactics and realistic expectations. European Command's steady demand signal. In Europe, MQ-9 operations from Campia Turzi, Romania have been publicly described as supporting NATO ISR missions since 2021. And Dutch MQ-9 deployments to Romania for NATO air shielding have been extended through March 31st, 2026, reflecting persistent Allied demand for unmanned ISR on the eastern flank. So what happens when planning documents point to 2035 as the horizon? The Air Force's posture implies three tracks. Track 1, a clean sheet successor, a more survivable next-gen ISR, strike drone is plausible, but timelines are long and fielding at scale is hard. Track 2, cheap swarms replace everything. Ukraine proved small drones matter, but small drones don't automatically replace a 27 to 34 hour endurance platform with meaningful sensors and networking. Track 3, squeeze more out of the Reaper. This is the track being resourced now. M2, DO, networking upgrades, selective survivability packages, and mothership experimentation, plus sustainment to keep the fleet viable as complexity rises. That creates the paradox. Official planning points to a sunset, but operational demand and funded upgrades point to a controlled continuation, shrinking the fleet, specializing the best aircraft, and using them where endurance and networking outweigh vulnerability. Most likely, Reapers don't vanish in 2035. The fleet narrows to the best equipped airframes, focused on missions where their strengths dominate. Maritime domain awareness, presence and deterrence, gray zone overwatch, and acting as nodes that connect sensors, shooters, and smaller attributable systems. The unspoken admission is simple. There is no ready, affordable replacement that does what MQ-9 does at scale right now. So the Pentagon is buying time, literally and figuratively. And that is what the up to $995 million award really represents. Not a declaration that MQ-9 is perfect, but a commitment to keep it useful while the U.S. figures out what comes next. The Reaper's evolution from counterterrorism hunter to distributed warfighting node is one of the biggest operational shifts in unmanned aviation since the Predator era. If you found this breakdown valuable, subscribe. We're going deep on defense tech that actually matters.